we're we're going to talk about love today and and just aspects of it but and what it looks like and uh, what does supernatural love look like when it's manifested through people like us and and if we can just remove the religious pretense from that for a minute all right uh, I, I want us to think about it from that perspective because we're going to we're going to see love supernatural love manifested through us in a very truthful way. And, you know, I was thinking about that, n- nothing against any of you, but I was thinking about it when we were uh, watching the kids, you know, and your children are clearly more spiritual than I am because, you know, they all are thinking of Jesus at Christmas time. Right? Now, you know why they, you know why they said that? Because Debbie asked him in front of the church. When I was a kid, I was thinking about presents and, and snacks and things you don't get to eat and brown paper bags full of goodies and, and all that stuff. And some of you do now still, you know, that, uh, and it's okay. I think it's funny. I just, you know, uh, it's kind of like an occupational hazard for me. I, I don't, like when I'm traveling, I never want to have to tell people what I do for a living because they immediately become holy when they find out I'm a pastor. You know, it's like, so what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a pastor. Now it's on, right? They are the most spiritual person I have ever met, right? You know, because you do that to me too. But, but I can't even be spiritual around me. Because I'm just a person like all of us. So when we look at that question, what does supernatural love look like when it's manifested through people? It looks messy. It looks messy. You know, we, we, we get this picture of, oh, to show love at Christmas, you know, we always want to. We're, we have a smile. There's always a sweetness about it. Right? And yet, sometimes the way it's manifested is you're kind of griping on your way out the door. Like, I don't know why I have to go over there. Here's the deal. Everyone in our neighborhood just about gets a box of shortbread cookies that Debbie makes. And she generally delivers them. The other day I had to because Matt ate the neighbor's box of cookies. And uh, I don't mind it if you know that he did that. And uh, so Debbie refilled it and said, would you take it over to so-and-so? And I'm like, really? You know? And and then I get over there, and of course, you know, I hand it to him. And oh, we're just glad to be able to give you something nice. And none of that's true. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. That's what Christmas love looks like, doing what you're supposed to do regardless of how you feel. Does that make sense to us? I think it does. And, and if we, so, so we remove that pretense and we become real about obeying the Lord Jesus. Now, sometimes we're excited about it and sometimes we're not. And, and so... I, I don't believe we can think of Christmas without considering love. And, and we consider it an aspect of the love of God that, that Christ might come to the earth, and which is ultimately the advent of Christ, his appearing on earth. And, and the Christmas advent, theologically speaking, is a 33-and-a-half-year event. It's not just the birth. It's he was born, he grew up, he stayed, you know, and hung out at the synagogue arguing with the Pharisees at 12 and his parents lost him, right? That's a big one. When you know you ha- you're you responsible for the Son of God and you lose him, that's a big one, right? And and, and then that's part of the Advent and and cleansing the temple and, and teaching and, and learning carpentry and working with his dad and serving his parents. It's all part of the Advent. So I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of that. How many have ever had a child in the terrible twos? 
Did any of you grow out of it? No, um, we, we, we did. One of ours uh, was a little more terrible than the other. They can't all take after me. And, and there's that, you know, and, and I was answering this question for someone the other day, like, what do we do about this kid? And, and uh, the scientific answer, right, is that the corpus chiasm, which is the cord of nerves that connects the left and right hemisphere of your brain, isn't fully developed till you know, you're around four or five years old. So the logic center of the brain doesn't communicate with the emotional brain. And when that's, that fails and they're having emotions and can't connect logically, they melt down. Which should give us patience. And, and so I, I remember I learned that while I was working on a, a master's degree in, in that sort of junk. And, and I learned it while we were having trouble with one of them. And I remember, like, it would be... Shocking to see, you know, Debbie would be face to face with this little child and they're just, it was unpleasant. And, and I remember thinking, oh, what are we going to do? And then I read this, that it's just, their brain's just not there yet. And something happened that's marvelous. And there, there, there are actual passages of time where, where, the human brain develops, and and it's like there's these magic, there's these magic mile markers where things change. And you know, two or three, you're going through this nightmare, and at four or five, you're like, "What a wonderful kid! How'd this happen?" Because something magic hap magical happened, and, and you know there there are these time frames, you know, like between middle school and high school, something happens, and something happens, you know, like the last year of high school, where, and then they go to college. You you see something click in their mind as it matures, and and in fact, you know, the that that's another issue: the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. You everyone say that three times. Um, isn't fully developed till you're in your 20s, early to mid 20s. And that's your ability to make rational decisions. That explains a lot. Doesn't it? And then we when we see and it's so beautiful, we see someone go through that and you're like, "Wow." There there's these things that happen and it, and it's it's not a sin issue. It's not, it's not even a failure to parent. It's just the human being grows at a certain rate of speed, and the, the brain, which is the organ itself, develops at the rate at which it develops. And, and here's, the, here's the deal. Jesus went through that. Talk about the humility of God and the love of Christ that Jesus, when he chose to become a person, said, hmm, going to go through the terrible twos. I'm going to be an adolescent that has trouble with abstract thought. I'm going to have to let my brain grow and let that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex develop. Talk about humility. See, we get this picture of Jesus that he wasn't fully man, but according to Scripture, he was. It's, and I'm not trying to be blasphemous or sacrilegious, certainly not, in any stretch of the imagination. But how many, how many know what comes with babies? Diaper bags come with babies. All of them, including the Messiah. What humility, what love. That God, that, you know, and the Bible says without Jesus nothing was made. That the word became, and, and without the word nothing was made, right? Because the word was God, and, and then it says, and the word became flesh. The power, that's John chapter 1. The power in that. The power in it. 
that he, knowingly having created man with all the glitches along the way as we mature and develop through infancy and, and childhood and adolescence, all the things that go with it, he said, I will go through that for them. That's love. And, and, you know, how many, how many would, would be willing to go through that again for someone? How many is like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go through adolescence again. Nobody wants to do that, but Jesus would do it. That's amazing. And he never had to. And so when we think about the Lord appearing that for God, and that's where we're going. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I'm going to start there. For God so loved the world. Right? And, I, and in God's word translation, it's this way. God loved the world this way. He gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not die but will have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That's love. That's it. And, and so we see that, and there it is. We have it. Christmas itself, the advent, the appearing of God in the flesh, was an act of love by God. That he gave his only son so that all who would believe in him could be saved. God sent his son into the world to save it, not to condemn it. So when we think about the things that we do, I mean, is there anyone here who just he gets up in the morning and says, hey, I'd love to go be embarrassed today? Is there anyone who ever gets through a day without being embarrassed, right? <laughs> you know, no one gets up and says, hey, uh, you know, I just want to I just want to really mess up today and have everybody think something's wrong with me. But God so loved the world that we don't have to be condemned. That's a beautiful thing. And, and, and we begin to realize there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus because of that event. And why? God so loved the world, he gave. What did he give? His only son. And we realize what is love about? It's giving. It's not, and I like to say love is an action. It's not a feeling. And people, oh, love's a feeling. No, love is doing the right thing regardless of how you feel. That's what love is. It's active. Love does. Love gives. Love sacrifices. Love serves. It's an action. It's not a feeling because feelings perish. And the Bible tells us love endures. And so we begin to realize that the very nature of love itself is selfless. Giving, sacrificing. Christ was sent not to condemn but to save. He summed it up after the resurrection and appearing to his disciples when we think about this, this idea of love and, and our responsibility. Right? John chapter 20 verse 21. And Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection, and, and here's what it says. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And you say, well, what does that mean? What, how am I being sent like Jesus was sent? For God so loved the world that he sent you. Not because you're the Messiah, not because you're the sinless sacrifice, but he loves the world enough. He loves the people around you enough to, to send you to them. And, and that love becomes a supernatural love that's manifested in our weakness. Isn't it amazing? And so I, I'm going to tell a story about that because, you know, Debbie was telling a story, reminding me of different things. Uh, and, and, in fact, uh, 
she picked out a family, and I'm glad she did, that, that she knew and um, that was having a rough Christmas because of something that happened to the dad and so on and so forth. And so she, you know, we had gifts and, and things that she wanted to take and drop off at this one place. And um, so we're together, and, and I'm, wait, I'm in the car while she's talking to the mom, and she's giving her these presents and bags and explaining everything. Right, and the mom's touched. You know that. Wow, my kids are going to basically have Christmas and get presents because of what you're doing. And and as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, wow, that reminds me of this man that owned a business that my dad worked for, who took it on himself to make sure that our family had Christmas. Having been on the receiving end of what my wife was doing for someone else, and I and I thought that's that's a, that's good. So I was thinking of another story, and the way it works is like this. And it was the food story. She talked about the deacon that the Lord woke him up and he brought food. Well, my my family has a similar story. Um, my dad was was relatively new to the Lord and. And uh, a lot of churches back in the day didn't have musical instruments. They they didn't have a lot of musicians, and a lot of there weren't. So what they his church what they do to start worship they had a tuning fork. You know, you ding, and it would that would give them the pitch, and they'd all start singing. Which yeah, it wasn't all that great, and um, they found out my dad could play the mandolin, which you know, essentially plays like a violin. And the and, um, problem was he could only read music, which is a good thing, right? That's quite a, that's a good thing, but that's all he could do. And so he could play this, every song out of the hymnal where it was written, right? Well, it, most of those songs are written too high. They're not for normal people. And, and the mandolin's kind of a high, squeaky instrument anyhow. And... Uh, so he'd get out there with his mandolin, and he'd start playing where it was written, and, it, and the congregation would try to muscle along through the songs. And uh, so one day, this lady who was a big deal in the church, right, big supporter, important person in the church, stood up and said, they called each other brother and sister, whether they meant it or not, and um, she got up and said, if Brother Adam's going to play that squeaky mandolin, I'm not going to sing in front of everyone. So he'd leave at home. And he'd get to church, and the pastor would say, where's your mandolin? Well, I left at home. Well, you can't listen to what people say. And it'd go like that, you know. And it went on like that for some time. And, and as he told the story, it went like this. He said, I finally decided I was just going to hate her, and that's how it was going to be. And we didn't, you know, uh, they had seven kids, and so there wasn't always a lot to go around. And um, he, so he decided he was going to hate this gal, and we didn't have a lot. And lo and behold, uh, she showed up, 6 o'clock in the morning, with bags and bags and bags of groceries. It really ruined his hate. And, and yet, what was she doing? Manifesting the supernatural love of God. And here's what it sounded like when she manifested the supernatural love of God. She said, you're lucky I listened to God. He woke me up at 2 in the morning and told me I had to bring food and get over here. And you're just lucky I listened to God because I didn't want to do it. And he had me up all night and I was getting groceries and it went on like that. And that was the manifestation of God's love through human beings. It's messy. And if you're waiting... For your perfection in the manifestation of God's love, you might be waiting a very long time. If you're waiting for that time when you never act in yourself, 
while trying to serve the Lord, forget it and get out there and do something anyhow. Because Christ has sent us into the world. As my Father sent me, so send I you. Into the world. And yes, this is what Christmas is about. What are we as Christians interested in? I think that's a viable question. Are we interested in saving the world or condemning the world? Because, you know, there's a lot of talk of condemnation that goes on. But what are we interested in? Saving the world or condemning it? If we aren't careful, our religion can become one of the condemnation of those Christ came to save. And we see that example of the, the, the adulterous woman in John chapter 8, you know, the, the, the religious leaders bring her and they toss her at the feet of the Lord and they say, we need to stone this gal. She, she, we caught her doing the wrong thing and we need to throw rocks at her till she's dead. And, you know, that's Jesus doodles in the dirt, ignores him a little bit. Then he says, you without sin throw the first stone. The Bible says they went away from the greatest to the least without saying anything. And he says to the woman, where are those that condemn you? And she says, they're all gone. He says, I don't condemn you either. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. Who does God want you to bless in that way? See, God wants to teach someone in your life the love of Christmas by teaching you not to condemn them. And I would say, don't become a modern-day Pharisee. In the case of the adulterous woman, and, and we, we went through that, that Jesus' love made a way of escape. And, and, and that's a beautiful thing, that the Lord was able to condemn and chose not to. And, and so we come to this realization that Jesus on earth exemplified love in two significant ways. The two great commandments. Right? Certainly we know what those are. I'm going to tell you anyhow, but the, the two great commandments. What's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Mark 12, 30. That's number one. What's number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. And in those two manifestations, the Lord exemplified God's love in the context of the advent. And we could read about it. Uh, I actually put down Matthew 22, 37 through 39. It says, uh, Jesus answered him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus perfectly exemplified this love. Now, if we look at it, the first thing he did was exemplify a love for the Father. That's what set him apart. He loved the Father. And he loved the Father's will, regardless of how he felt. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Lord, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, nonetheless, your will be done. That's a love for the Father. And, and there are things God will call you to do that you might do in a, in a grudging sort of way. That's okay, just do them. Just do them. You, you know the, the story of the two sons? A man had two sons. He said to one son, I need you to go do such and such. And the son said, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. He goes to his other son says, I need you to do this, this, and this. And the other son says, absolutely, I'll take care of it right away. Now the one that said, I'll do it, and I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Didn't do anything. He just ignored his father. But the one that said, I'm not doing that. He felt guilty later and went and did what he was asked. Which one obeyed the Father? See, before you try to be this perfect 
little Christianese to just be a real person doing your best to serve the Lord. Just try your best to obey the Lord even if you don't feel like it. So when Jesus says, as my father sent me, so send I you, he was saying it to men who knew exactly how and why he was sent. And the top priority of our lives is going to be to love God in the face of all that is worldly. And of course, you know, of course there are times in when it seems difficult to serve God. We know that. There are times when it's hard. There are times it's hard to be patient there and we fail. And there are times it's hard to serve the Lord. It's time and, and there's temptation and there's challenges and all that's happening. Do you know that's our job? Is to serve the Lord in the face of adversity. And, and at some point, as people, we have to stop making excuses about how hard it is to serve the Lord. And, and keep getting up and doing it no matter how many times we stumble. That's what it takes. And, and then Jesus identifies priority number two is loving others. Now, first of all, we know we can't interchange those. We can't make loving humanity priority number one. We have to make loving God priority number one. If we, make, if we switch those commandments around then we've broken the first commandment. And those who break the greatest commandment are the greatest of sinners. So we can't do that. We, we can't say, well, I'm just going to love people. Well, i got to love God first or I'm breaking the most important rule. But then, out of that love for God flows a love for humanity that, that becomes supernatural. And so... So we see that, and, and this is love, as Jesus put it. This is love, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. What is, what is love is an action, not a feeling. Now, I know if you've watched enough romantic Christmas movies, you actually think love is a feeling, but that's scripted. What Jesus said is love is laying down your life for a friend. And he went any further and he said, love your enemies. And love is action. We are sent into the world to love people even when they don't agree with us. Are you prepared for that? To love people that don't agree with you. To love people that have a different opinion, a different outlook than you. People who, who embrace beliefs and, and lifestyles that you find appalling. Are you prepared to love them because the Lord sent you to them? You know that whole WWJD was popular, right? Who, what would Jesus do? Right? We get new bracelets, WWJS. Who would Jesus shoot? No one. No one. Who would Jesus attack? Who would Jesus, right? Where do we come to this? I, went, I mentioned the woman caught in adultery who Jesus chose not to condemn. He could have and he chose not to. Another interesting case is, is the Samaritan woman, right? She's married a few times. Now she's living with a guy. And Jesus doesn't condemn her. He introduces her to salvation instead. She wasn't pointed to her sin. She was pointed to the Savior. And, and what we have to come to grips with in our day and age as we deal with folks is that people have stories, don't they? And you know your story. And you have baggage because of some of your stories. Right? It's there. It sneaks up on us sometimes. 
But see, all those people around you that you might want to judge, they have a story too. And they have baggage because of that story. How people were raised and what they went through and the abuses they've suffered and the emotional and mental, those things influence the, the direction that they take in life. That direction that we're so quick to judge was influenced by the pain and failure of those around them. And they're trapped in it. And God sees people in the light of their story, and he loves them. And when we look at the adulterous woman or the woman at the well, he, he knew their story because he was Jesus. Still is, by the way. And, and he knew their story, and he looked into their life, and he measured them based on their story. It's an amazing idea. You say, well, then I guess I just need to know everybody's story. No, you don't. That never works out. You just need to know that people have one and that you might not know what it is. There's a, there are reasons that people fail. And if God sees people in the right light of their story, even if we don't know their story, we have to see them in the light of that story anyhow. And we know this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I, I come to this when I think of it in Christmas time. I would never want to replace Christ on the great white throne of judgment. I think it's his throne. The great white throne of judgment in the book of Revelation, that's his throne. I've got no, I got no business with it. And we want to be careful as we begin to judge people around us as good, bad Christians, judging their beliefs, their, how they vote, whatever their choices may be. We begin to judge all these things. Aren't we just like trying to shove the Lord off the great white throne and take his place there? And is it our, is, is that do we really have the authority to do that? Or the righteousness to do it? And so we ask, but what about bad people? What am I supposed to do with bad people? Technically, that's everyone. Because there are none who are good. So what do we, Jesus gave us an answer. What do you do with bad people? It's in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 43. It says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In this way, you show that you are children of your Father in heaven. He makes his sun rise on people, whether they're good or evil. He lets rain fall on them, whether they're just or unjust. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What about bad people? Love them and pray for them. That's what Jesus says to do. And that's what God would do because that's what God has done. So as we come to understand who we are to love, we must consider what love does. And we find that, of course, many of you are familiar with it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? And we, when we read this description, we have to look at it and say, Lord, is that me? Is that, is that what I'm, is that, is that happening for me? And sometimes he'll show you where it's not. And, and now here's the thing. I like that love is an action and not a feeling. Because if it says love is kind, I can be kind even if I don't feel it. Right? You know, it's like, now everybody knows this. I'll use a different example. I believe in reading the Bible every day. 
I do it. Have for years. Very faithful to it. And I, I'll never forget being in a Bible study where people say, said, it's not enough just to do it every day. You have to want to. And, and, and I'm like, wait, stop, stop, stop. I can't want to every day. I can't wake up going, yay, every day. But I can do it. I can do it. I can take the step. So we get back to the whole diaper bag thing, right? I was a pretty good dad in that department. I carried it everywhere. No, I'm kidding. I was good about changing them. Not because I thought it was fun, but because I didn't think it was fun for them if I didn't. See, you don't have to wait till you're excited about doing the right thing. We do the right thing because that's what God has called us to do. For God so loved the world that he didn't just send Jesus, he sent you. And you need to honor that calling because Jesus said, as my father sent me, so send I you. So in other words, for Jesus loved the world enough to send you and he's trusting you no matter how you feel. So love is this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 4. Love is patient. I hate that part. I don't really, but you know what I mean. So we're going to hurry through the patient part. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love isn't jealous. It doesn't sing its own praises. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't think about itself. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep track of wrongs. It isn't happy when injustice is done, but is happy with truth. Love never stops being patient, never stops believing, never stops hoping, never gives up. Love never comes to an end. As I read that, here's what I learn. If human love has to fit that description all the time, there is no love on planet Earth. If your own marital love had to fit this description without failure, then you're in a loveless marriage. But if in spite of who I am, the Lord keeps loving that way through me, A miracle is happening. If love depends on me, it is going to be impatient. How many know that? If it if it depends on me, it's it's gonna think about itself, it's gonna get irritated, and it 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 might have a little book of wrongs. You know, a vengeance manual. Say, oh, I don't have one. (laughs) I bet you quote from it at your next argument. But the love of the Lord is like this. And he works through us till we slowly get there. I, I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to, you know, approach life. I can't, as a, as I cannot approach life in a way that looks like a Thomas Kincaid painting. I, I've, I know, I, I get it. I will grab life by the throat. And fight with it. Because that's how I was created. And if God's not in there with me, it's going to be horrible. But when he's in there with me, it's still supernatural love, even when it's messy. And... and that's the beauty of it. It isn't our our failures don't taint what God does. Your failures don't mess up God's love. It's the other way around. 
God's love cleans up your failures. I'll never forget a, a young a, a friend of mine passed away, and I, his son was in high school, and I picked him up for lunch and took him to lunch one day after his dad had died, and I said, uh, I'm just, I just want to tell you, you know, I, I, just, I just don't feel like I was much help for you when your dad died. I just, I just don't feel like I could do much for you. And he says, oh, Charles, you know what I remember? He says, you were there. He didn't remember my failures because God's supernatural. Don't you see that? And we, so I'm closing with this idea that we see this woman in the scriptures and she's got an issue of blood. She's, she's menstruating all the time. She never gets a break. And she's gone to doctors and she's tried to get help and no one can help her. And she's a mess. And she tells herself, if I can just touch the hem of the Lord's garment, I can be healed. And, and here's, the, here's the reality of that situation. In the flesh, in the world, according to the law of Scripture, even, if she touched Jesus in that condition, she would have made him unclean. But not when you touch the Lord. A miracle happened. And, and why did it happen? Because the Lord had already given her a clue that says, you won't, you won't make him unclean. It'll be the other way around. You'll touch the Lord and, and supernaturally you'll be clean. And we, we see in that the message of salvation. And what I'm telling you, in all your failures to serve the Lord perfectly, those don't make the Lord look bad. God is always making you look good. And we, we hear people say, well, you know, if the church, the church has failed and that's why more people aren't coming to the Lord, that is not what Jesus said. That's not a truth. In, in John chapter 3, you know, I didn't read that verse, but it's in verse 19, right? That, that those, those, though the light came into the world, this is the condemnation, that light came into the world, and people loved darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. The reason people aren't coming to Jesus is because their evil deeds are causing them to love darkness more than light. It's not because the church has failed. It's because people love darkness. And that's what Jesus said. We can't argue with that. But when he loves through the church, it doesn't matter how imperfect we are. I'll close with another story. And, and I'm, you know, when I get working on something, I, you know, Debbie's mentioned this. I'm sure she's wrong, but... Um, when I get working on something, it's all I can see. Right? That's all I can see. And, and so, like, when I was working on degrees in, in school, you know, we'd be eating dinner, and I'm, I'm working on stuff in my head, and I don't even know anyone else is at the table. If I start a project, it's all I can see. I get really myopic about it. And, and so it was, I was a furniture mover, and it was like that. I was myopic. I, my mission, I was up at uh, Fort Lewis, and my mission was to move someone. And I had to inventory the shipment and get it on the truck and get going. And this knothead kept asking me about Jesus. He didn't know I was in a hurry. It's the funniest thing. And so he, he's in the military, obviously, because I was at Fort Lewis. And he says, well, you sound like, you know, the way, just the way you talk sounds like you maybe you went to college and stuff. I said, yeah, I did. Kept working. Right? My head is like, go away. He says, well, where do you go to school? I said, oh, I went to Bible college. Oh, I keep working. He says, does that ever make you, like, want to be a pastor or something? Like, well, I was once. I keep working because I'm in a hurry and I got to get my job done. And I'm failing miserably. 
at what God has called me to do in that moment. So I go onto the truck, and, and he's, he's the most irritating person. I can't believe it. He comes on the truck while I'm working and starts bugging me. And finally, in this process, just like this, I turn to him and say, do you want to get to know Christ or not? He says, yes, I do. And with tears in my eyes, I led him to the Lord. Because in our weakness, God is made strong. And that was what supernatural love working through a person looks like. It's always messy. Failure is an option because Christ lives in you, and that's the hope of all glory. This Christmas season, you might think you're not good enough. You might miss the boat. You might fail. You might not know who to love or how to love. But God will show you the way, and you will stumble your way into success. And like the lady that brought food by our door, you, you, you know, my dad had decided I'm going to hate this gal. She's a mean stinker, and she was. It didn't stop God from using her. Didn't stop him from using her. And that's why I would say, you know, one of the things that's happened when we think about love that's broken, I think, is we've gotten really institutionalized in our nation. So, you know, we, we think, well, what institution can I support that will help people at Christmas time? But long ago, we didn't have those institutions. So we had to help each other. And so the way it works around here sometimes, that's why uh, when Debbie was talking about it, I, I was saying, don't call us because here's what happens. God lays someone on your heart and you call me to find out how they're doing. That's not why he laid you them on your heart. He didn't lay someone on your heart so you could call Debbie and ask if she knew how they were doing. He laid them on your heart so you would call them directly and find out how they're doing. If God says to you, get groceries or presents for this family, that doesn't mean call and see if they need it. It means God has made a decision and wants to use you. Just do it. Just do it. Well, what if I make a mistake? So what? You know, if, you, if you're sitting there thinking, I just never want to make another mistake in my life. Too late. That was your, that was your most recent one. You're going to. You're going to mess up. It's okay. Jesus forgives and works through us. Just just. Make a mess. So I was thinking about this uh, as I'm closing, and the Lord brought it back to my mind. And some of you will recognize the name. Uh, he's, a, he's a famous uh, jazz trumpet player named Miles Davis, right? Known for tremendously clear tone. And uh, I was thinking of a statement he made, and it was this. Music has mistakes in it. People would come from all over to hear him. And his answer was, music has mistakes in it. And sometimes it just works out. And, and, and I heard that statement and I thought, I mean, like the, the, just this last week, and I thought, wow, that sums up my walk with the Lord. It's got mistakes in it. And what's funny is some of the things we think are mistakes aren't. And some of the things we think are booming successes were the mistakes. And God doesn't tell us because he's nice. But God moves through us. And it, it doesn't seem to matter. And that's love. And as we're called to love him and love people, we have to do it with some sort of action, not just a feeling. Not just some superficial expression, but, 
yes, Lord, I'll, I'll do what you ask me to do. So uh, I want to pray for us before, and then we have a video, Happy Birthday, Jesus. Lord, we, uh, in moments like these, we, we really become poor in spirit, where we realize we don't have the resources to be who you've called us to be, except the resources that you give. Lord, that, that we recognize that we have failed and we, we fully expect to do it again. But Lord, may you love us and then love others through us. With all of our shortcomings, with all of our mistakes, I pray, Lord, that we make room for you to supernaturally love people around us through us. And that it brings you glory and not us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.